After the break, we hear exclusively from a woman convinced Levi Belfield tried to kill her. He's confessed, but she's still waiting for justice. Tonight, a confession by serial killer Levi Belfield and an alleged victim left in the dark. Sarah Sparrow was brutally attacked and almost died in 2004. Belfield was linked to it and recently confessed to it. Sarah, though, was never told by police. But why? She's spoken exclusively to us. I heard the blood hit the car next to me. I remember his eyes, even though he's wearing a balaclava, his size, his build, his eyes, they were evil, like pure. Like, whoever it was wanted to kill me. Tonight, we get reaction from the lead detective who put Belfield behind bars about those claims, also ahead. A court hears the first words spoken by the driver of a tram after it crashed in Croydon, killing seven plus. Don't move, what are you moving for? Oh, God, it's your nose. Just don't. Or I shall start the whole thing again from scratch. No, 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 no. Corrie's Dame Maureen Lipman will be here to talk about her new London play. If, like me, you thought flowers were all sweetness and light, don't be deceived. Take a look at this a Jurassic Park dinosaur doing its worst. Chelsea is blooming in extraordinary ways this week. Good evening. Tonight, we speak to a woman who believes that she was brutally attacked and left for dead by serial killer Levi Belfield almost 20 years ago. Sarah Sparrow was attacked from behind with a weapon as she walked down a street in Hastings back in 2004 when she saw a photo of Levi Belfield, who at that point had been convicted of Millie Dowler's murder. She said she knew instantly that he was the man who'd attacked her. But, according to Sarah, police didn't take it seriously. But fast forward to March this year, when Belfield confessed to her attempted murder. Though police never informed Sarah or spoke to Belfield. But why? Tonight, she tells her story, as Sam Holder reports. I remember his eyes, his build, his eyes. They were evil. Whoever it was wanted to kill me. It's a vision that's haunted Sarah Spurrell for two decades a glimpse of the man who left her for dead. Now there has been a confession by serial killer Levi Belfield. I was smacked over the back of the head before I could even turn around and look who it was. I'd then been hit another two times. She was attacked randomly and repeatedly with a weapon from behind. But she claims Sussex police failed to take it seriously. They basically made a complete like, joke of it. Um, I asked them, could they go and investigate the crime scene? Why are they still here, laughing about their weekend or weekend to come? Um, and they turned around and blatantly said in front of me and my mum, we're not CSI, Hastings police haven't got that much money. Sarah was attacked right in the middle of Levi Belfield's known series of murders. He would stalk his victims, usually women with blonde hair, and attack them with a hammer or other blunt object. The first was 13-year-old Millie Dowler, who disappeared while walking home from school in Walton-on-Thames in 2002. 19-year-old Marsha McDonnell was killed in Richmond in 2003. Sarah was attacked in January 2004 in Hastings in Sussex. A few months later, Belfield deliberately ran over 18-year-old Kate Sheedy in Isleworth, but she survived. In August 2004, 22-year-old French student Amélie Delagrange was bludgeoned to death on Twickenham Green. The fact the same man may be responsible weighs heavily on Sarah. If the police had done something about it, then all the girls that he's killed, all the girls that he's killed after me, was still here as well. It's a big crime, it? The link to Hastings was first made by retired detective Colin Sutton, who put Belfield behind bars for the murder of Millie Dowler. Belfield was working as a car clamper in Chichester in 2004 and visited his friend who ran a pub in Hastings. Police have confirmed there was another similar attack there on the same night as Sarah. These types of assaults, random, against women and using a blunt weapon, are incredibly rare. Virtually all of those offences, if not indeed all of those offences, can arguably be put down to Levi Belfield. He's just the most dangerous 
person I ever came across. Colin says he first made Sussex police aware of the connection to Hastings back in 2008. But nothing happened. Belfield is a known narcissist who enjoys toying with the police and making up confessions. With Sarah's case, there is strong evidence. But ITV News understands Sussex police have not yet interviewed him, despite him confessing months ago. There is a duty on police to do two things. One of those is to go and speak to Levi Belfield, who's admitting them, and see what he has to say and see if there's any truth in his admissions. But secondly, and in my view, more importantly, is to go back to those survivors, back to the victims, and tell them what you're doing and offer them the support and help so that they can continue to live their lives in the light of what they now know. But until our investigation, nobody from Sussex Police told Sarah that he'd confessed to her attack. Oh my God, if the police had given me people to identify and he was in it, I would have told them straight away there and then that was the person that attacked me. What about all the other people that have been attacked and the police haven't bothered to look into it or have just treat them as a joke like they have done me? Belfield is suspected of many more crimes than he's been sentenced for, leaving victims like Sarah questioning whether they survived a serial killer. Sam, what have Sussex police had to say? Well, Charlene, in response to Sarah's criticisms about the uh, police conduct at the very start after she sort of reported being attacked, uh, they say that they are sorry that she feels the service was not satisfactory and that officers did carry out a search at the scene for a potential suspect or uh, weapon. We now know that Sussex police are now in contact with Sarah, but that actually only came about after we got in contact with them on Friday uh, to raise the concerns that she feels. Um, obviously, she is desperate to know whether this confession from Levi Belfield is true, whether he was the one who attacked her all those years ago. But Sussex police didn't answer our question on whether they have now spoken to him or are planning to speak to him. What they did say is that this remains an active investigation and we will be keeping the victim updated as we review information that's recently come to light, which has yet to be corroborated. And, and has she heard from them? Well, she's heard from them. Uh, she's got a letter from them that was sent on Friday, but it really just contains most of what we've talked about here. OK, Sam, thanks very much. A rail worker is in hospital with a bleed on the brain and a fractured skull after a serious assault at Harrow on the Hill Station this morning. British Transport Police have released this CCTV image of a man they'd like to speak to in connection with the incident. They've described it as an appalling, um, unprovoked attack, act of violence and are asking anyone with any information to come forward. Lee Rigby's son has raised more than £40,000 to help other bereaved forces children. Jack Rigby was two when his father was murdered by Islamist extremists outside Woolwich Barracks 10 years ago today. The now 12-year-old has run a total of 26.2 miles this month, with all the funds going to the charity Scotty's Little Soldiers. And Heathrow bosses say no flights will be cancelled when security officers strike during half term next week. Members of the Unite Union working at Terminal 5 are planning to walk out from the 25th to the 27th of May in a dispute over pay. But Heathrow say contingency plans are in place. Next tonight, it's the first words spoken by the driver of a tram straight after it crashed, killing seven people. Alfred Doris was travelling at three times the speed limit when the tram derailed on a sharp corner in Croydon. Today, survivors told the Old Bailey they heard him ask, how did that happen? Daniel Henry is there for us. Daniel, what else was said in court? Well, everything else we heard in court today was shared through a series of statements from the survivors of witnesses because they had said that how difficult they've been finding it to relive these experiences from November 2016 when that tram derailed. One of those passengers on that tram was someone called Cabal Lachlan. Uh, Cabal was on, on their way to, to Putney and they spoke about the severe turbulence that they experienced on the tram as it came off of the rails and as the carriage came off the track and noticing that it had all gone pitch black. And we also heard from a statement from uh, Fausta Bernardo, Fausta talking about finding themselves under a chair when the tram had derailed, their glasses off of their head, and eventually in front of the driver, 
when they spoke to the driver and asked the driver what happened and the driver saying to them he doesn't know. Now that driver was Alfred Doris and we heard from one of his former colleagues today who describes Doris as someone who was very professional and very good at what he did. Mr Doris denies failing to take reasonable care of the health and safety of himself and 69 of the passengers. The trial continues here at the Old Bailey and is expected to last for four weeks. OK, Daniel, thank you. Now, our first guest tonight is a writer who spent a year as a police constable in the Metropolitan Police because he says he wanted to help vulnerable groups in their most vulnerable moments. What Matt Lloyd Rose got was an insight into the sexism and misogyny the Met says it needs to stamp out. And so he's written a book about it and joins us now. Thanks so much for, for coming in to talk to us um, about this. Now, just to clarify, you were the special constable eight years ago, weren't you? And you spent a year patrolling the streets of Brixton and Clapham, is that correct? I mean, what sort of things, I don't know, what sort of experience did you think you were going to get when you went into this? So I'd actually been a primary school teacher in South London before being a police officer and thought, gosh, it would be interesting to get a bit deeper into the area where I lived in Brixton to understand more of the challenges that the people in the area faced, particularly young people faced. I wasn't really sure what I'd see. I'd, I think I probably had a slightly simplistic idea that we'd be like, fighting crime, catching criminals. I think the reality that I encountered was, was a lot more complex, that actually we were dealing with, as you say, a lot of really vulnerable people at their most vulnerable moments. And I, I really found that the police see a lot of our most complex social issues kind of at their most raw. Now, you have made secret notes, didn't you, whilst you were on patrol, um, notes that have been used then for, for this book. What were the most shocking moments that you encountered with other police officers? Yes, I did take notes. I, I didn't go into it planning to write a book, but it was just felt really important to capture everything I was seeing and everything, not just the, the things that were shocking. But um, certainly for, on my very first shift, I remember there was a moment when some of the regular officers we were patrolling with said on Clapham High Street, now we're going to go talent spotting. And we drove back and forth along the high street and they were making comments about um, women who were walking up and down the high street. And I found that coming from having been a primary school teacher, uh, just really remarkable thinking, gosh, we're here to protect and support this community. And yet this feels really predatory and kind of just not the kind of culture that I would have expected for mm. a role with that level of responsibility and power, I think. Now, in, in light of that, and considering the Casey report back in March, where um, uh, she did say that the, she found the Met to be institutionally racist, homophobic and sexist, does that ring true with your experience as a police constable? Yeah, it was really curious, Charlene, because I think what I found really interesting was that on the same evening that then we might there might have been that talent spotting or someone making a misogynistic remark. I find it, the officers I was with would often police each other's racist language. If someone said something that sounded a bit racist, they would police that. So it was interesting seeing the way that these the different forms of institutional prejudice actually mm. played out in very different ways. Because if you look at the outcomes for the police, it is institutionally racist. If you look at how likely you are to be stopped and searched as a young black person versus a young white person, those outcomes are really different. If you look at how likely someone is to die in custody, that is really different depending on your race. So there's these institutionally racist outcomes, but it's quite a, they're quite different phenomena in a way. Yeah. All right. Well, Matt, thank you so much for coming in to talk to us. Thank you. Still to come, the Gurkha from Kent, who's just made history on Everest, and... I've got something to show you. Take a look at this. Is this the biggest smile you've ever seen in flowers? They've gone mad for flowers here in Chelsea. I've got plenty more to show you very soon. And the weather, look, no coat. To hear. Just what we like to hear, right. Uh, but first, almost a year to the day since it opened, the full Elizabeth Line service is now up and running. From today, passengers can travel directly from Shenfield to Heathrow, marking the first milestone of the Crossrail project. And there was a famous face on board to celebrate, as Carolyn Sim reports. To celebrate direct trains between Essex and Heathrow, the Elizabeth Line needed to bring a local on board. Cheers, mate, thank you. Bosh. And Romford-born Tom Skinner, star of the TV show The Apprentice, was just the ticket. And I've got all the way from Essex on the fantastic, the new Elizabeth line, and it's completely hassle-free. 
From today, trains will run from Shenfield to Heathrow's Terminal 5 with no need to change in a journey that takes just 80 minutes. The new timetable marks the completion of the much-delayed Crossrail. It's fantastic news for uh, our city. The trains are spacious, uh, they're stylish, uh, huge capacity, walk through, and in summer they're great because they're all air-conditioned. The biggest demand on the Elizabeth Line has been here at Tottenham Court Road Station, where an extra 100,000 journeys a day have been passing through here since it opened. And on the line as a whole, 150 million journeys have been made in its first year, making it one of the most used railways in the country. Go! Construction started way back in 2009. After multiple delays, the line, which will forever carry her name, was opened by the late Queen Elizabeth in May last year. Since then, there have been some passenger complaints about overcrowding and reliability. And listen to this. While we were filming this morning, the line was part suspended because of a fault with the doors at Paddington. It hasn't been without hiccups though, has it? Well, we're very proud of the performance of the line. Uh, obviously, there have been uh, some disruption with the occasional fault, which, uh, sorry for those customers that have been impacted, but the railway is still in the top five uh, best-performing railways in the country. And for one week only, the spotlight is firmly on Essex, with Tom Skinner taking over the tannoy. Well, listen, sit back, relax. I'm driving a train and I'm all right here. Have a good day. A bosh. As TFL bosses hope the line will be a success for years to come. Carolyn Sim, ITV News, on the Elizabeth Line. The service is so good. Very excited about our next guest tonight. She's an Olivier Award winning actress who's a regular nightly feature on our screens in Coronation Street. But now Dame Maureen Lipman is heading back to the London stage and the Ambassador's Theatre in One Woman Play Rose. Such a pleasure to have you in the Sarah, studio. Thanks thank so you. much for coming in. How does it feel to revive the role? Because it was on the stage before in London, wasn't it? It was on the stage 25 years ago with Olympia Dukakis when I was not of an age to play it, although I, I did get the chance, but I was completely swamped at that point by BT. So I thought, well, you know, I'd, I'd rather be a, playing a nun than another <laughs> Jewish mother. But this, this, uh, this time, yeah, we did it eight months ago. We did it in lockdown, actually, for, um, you know, because it was uh, just one person. Yeah. Uh, and we filmed it in a weekend. It's it is two hours, but it wow. just flies, <laughs> unless you're me, in which case you know, you're so nervous. And uh, tomorrow night's the first audience, like and it's the story of a... It is the story of the 20th century experience of an immigrant and a survivor. Yeah. But if I say that, um, it doesn't mean that it's like a Jewish event. It's, it's universal about how we treat immigrants and particularly new to me was the whole sequence about the British mandate in in Palestine because that was something that we didn't talk about in my house mm -hmm. in Hull uh, and so that whole experience of the sort of Arabists in the Foreign Office really clubbing the refugees who just come out of the camps and mount boarding the ships and yeah. there's so much in it that it is um, uh, an indictment of the way we treat people who are fleeing. But then I guess that has themes that can be reflected now. And we have, you know, millions of refugees around the world trying to find somewhere that they can call home. And there are there are themes that, yes, are from a from a time past that are still very relevant now. We don't empathise. We don't. We just think the other is coming in. And Rose's point of view, she goes from the Ukraine and she goes to end up running, owning a hotel in Miami. So it's got lots of levity. It's yeah. funny and it's serious. And it's written by Martin yeah. Sherman, who's a bit of a genius. Yeah. I'll shut up now, shall I? No! <laughs> it's such, it is, honestly, it's a beautiful script. It really, really is. It's very different, though, isn't it, from, from what's been the day job, which is, which is Corrie. But has it been nice to take time out to do this? Well, they've been very kind and they've let Evelyn go off to look after her daughter, who's not that well, and she didn't even know she had one. Um, <laughs> that's soap for you, um, uh, which she knew. Um, uh, and they've let me out. And uh, so the scripts from Corrie were like being thrown at me, huge. Mm. Claire Sweeney and I have a 13-page scene. Or one, uh, so, so it's been really hard to learn the 47 pages of Rose. <laughs> at and, the uh, same time? Yeah. So we've had a week's rehearsal. We have an audience tomorrow night. 
and it's going to be great. Oh my goodness, <laughs> mate, it'll be incredible. How are you feeling? I feel very nervous. I, I don't spend a lot of time out of the bathroom. This is a treat. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, I just want to say those words. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I firmly believe you'll be absolutely wonderful. I've had every faith in I you, I completely believe you now. <laughs> thank you. You'll be brilliant. Maureen, thanks so much for coming in to talk to us about it. And good Pleasure. luck tomorrow. Pleasure. Thank you. The Chelsea Flower Show kicked off today, as too did Chelsea in Bloom, London's largest free flower festival. Well, Sally's there for us now. Sally, how's it looking? Gorgeous. You know, Chelsea, Charlene, is just over there. But if you don't have a ticket, don't worry, just come here because they've got about 100 displays. There's flowers everywhere. And the main theme this year is flowers on film. So I'm going to give you a clue about this one. We've got a beautiful lion here. We've got Pride Rock and then Castor out there. We've got Rafiki lifting up. Yes, little Simba. It is, of course, the Lion King. And it's not the only film that's on display. And here to tell us a little bit more about it is Sophia. Thank you so much and well done. Done. Now, Sophia, we talked earlier and you told me that your favourite one was Mary Poppins. So hopefully we can see some pictures of that one. Tell me why you liked it so much. It's just the most magical display and it's actually inspired by the Walt Disney classic, which, as it happens, was written by P.L. Travers, who used to be a Chelsea resident. That's kind of nice coincidence, isn't it? And we've also got to mention the brilliant uh, Jurassic Park one. It's kind of rather striking, not very fluffy, as I always associate flowers to be. How did that uh, get in here? Well, Jurassic Park is just a cult classic and as it happens it's celebrating its 30th anniversary this year gosh so, 30 or a, wow <laughs> i know and we could not have an eight and a half meter dinosaur in sloan square could we <laughs> no good point tell me a bit about what this brings to chelsea it's just the most amazing community event and obviously with the chelsea flower show on our doorstep it just makes chelsea that bit more accessible it's buzzing, the atmosphere is joyful and infectious, and the shops benefit, the restaurants are overflowing, footfall, I mean, last year we had over a million visitors in the week, so and hopefully. That's huge, how many is that compared to normal? It's almost double, so it wow. really is amazing. It does make a difference. Um, I've also got to mention the fact that um, Chelsea Flower Show itself is running, and we've got some lovely pictures here of the Princess of Wales, who had a fabulous day because the weather is beautiful. Uh, just coming back to you, Sophia, what is it about Chelsea that is so special at this time of year? It just brings the community out. Businesses, shops, restaurants, hotels love to get involved. It's, it's, a, it's a competition after all, so we have nearly 100 displays. The community enjoy it so much, yeah. getting involved, taking their photos. For example, on Sloan Square, you can actually pick up a free rickshaw ride or even join a walking tour. <laughs> That's amazing. And people can vote for their favourite ones. So get yourself down here. Like I said, they, it is free. You don't have to buy a ticket. Now, let's go back to the weather because we've got a very special weekend coming up, haven't we? A bank holiday. We've done quite well with our bank holidays this year. And the weather at the moment is looking rather nice. So get your fingers crossed and hopefully it'll stay that way. Here we go. Here's the forecast. ITV London Weekday Weather is sponsored by Octopus Electric Vehicles. Car, charger and energy. Well, we can't complain too much at this forecast. Looking quite nice, fine and dry for most of the week. Uh, some nice warm, sunny spells. And it is feeling gradually warmer through the week as well. Maybe a touch colder tomorrow, but cold's not really the word. Let's take a look at the pressure chart. And you can see that our old friend, High Pressure, is in charge. Now, we might get some weak fronts just sinking south, which will bring a bit of cloud, but it looks to stay dry. Through the week, could just be a little bit cooler out to the east with a bit of an easterly flow. Let's have a look at tonight. Out here now, hardly a cloud in the sky. Some of you might have a bit more. We'll have quite a lot of clear skies overnight. And then by dawn, with a, a front sinking south, that'll bring a bit more low cloud. And our temperatures just dipping down to single figures for many areas. Areas. But tomorrow morning, that cloud will clear quite quickly and we should get some of that sunshine coming through. Again, a bit more cloud building up during the day, but still some sunshine at times. And where we get it, quite nice and warm, maybe a degree down on today. And again, a touch cooler at the coast. So highs of about 18 to 20. Into the evening, looking fairly pleasant. Once again, some evening sunshine on the cards, all being well and staying dry. And then we head off to the outlook and not a huge amount of change. Sunny spells with the temperatures doing very well. Let's take a look at the pollen. ITV London Weekday Weather is sponsored by Octopus Electric Vehicles. Hello, Summer. Piri sponsors ITV Pollen Count. 
if you have hay fever, hopefully you'll be able to make the most of the fact that the grass pollen levels are low. There is still, though, some oak pollen in the air. That's it from us all here in Chelsea. Have a lovely evening. Cheerio. Finally, four years ago, Harry Buddha Magar sat in his office in London and hatched a plan to be the first double amputee to reach the summit of Mount Everest. And this weekend, the former Gurkha did it, saying he hopes he's proved nothing is impossible. Asangita Kondoli reports. It is amazing, uh, uh, but also it's, it's kind of unreal. You know, I used to, you know, sit here, I was thinking... You know, how, how am I going to do it? And uh, now it's done. I can't believe it. Oh, yeah. Making your way up Mount Everest is a momentous task for anyone. But for Harry Budamagar from Kent, it has been harder than you can imagine. He has now made history as the first double above the knee amputee ever to climb Everest. Yeah, I was thinking lot, lots of things. It's just trying to focus one step at a time. <laughs> but make sure uh, you know teams are okay. We're all good. All our oxygen is um, enough in, enough to uh, come down. Hot water. It's amazing. Harry, a former corporal in the Gurkha regiment, lost both his legs from an IED in Afghanistan in 2010. With the help of his prosthetic legs, he undertook the punishing, grueling expedition to Everest, which saw him face extreme temperatures. But the weather and um, the weather wasn't that favorable, uh, but we, we, were, we were able to uh, summit. Just uh, thinking of the um, of last five years, five years of hard work. Hello, guys, you okay? It wasn't just the last five years of training that was hard work for Harry. There was a legal challenge before the climbing one, as Harry fought to overturn a Nepalese law banning disabled people from attempting to reach the peak. And the overriding part of his climb has been to change perceptions on disability. Keep, keep continuously um, uh, making awareness of disability and um, uh, changing the perception uh, on persons with a disability. Harry hopes his history-making Everest expedition will inspire others to challenge themselves. Sangeeta Kandola, ITV News. That's all we've got time for. Mary's here next with the ITV Evening News. But from all of us here on the London team, enjoy your evening. Bye-bye.